Welcome to uh, the study of God's prophetic word. This is the third uh, class in our series of eight. And uh, today we're going to be looking at the Neo-Babylonian Empire, which was a very short time that it was uh, a world empire, or a very great empire in the, Meta in the uh, uh, region of the Mesopotamian area. And we'll focus on one great event and then look at some other prophecies. But first of all, the fall of the proud Nebuchadnezzar. Most interesting study from scripture confirmed by Nebuchadnezzar's own uh, writings. Now, first of all, let's talk about civilization because we are dealing with civilizations in the Mesopotamian region. People can live in their uh, situation, where is uh, we call it hermetic, they're on their own. Uh, people have to do all the everything for themselves, grow their food, build their houses, protect them, have their worship services, get their clothes, and, and all these things. And of course, that takes up all their time. And so they're developed in Mesopotamia. The concept of people living in a community that was characterized by a division of labor and interdependent relationships. By that we mean division of labor, people developed and practiced one skill, practiced it well until they could perfect it, do it well, and they could do it quickly. And uh, then we have interdependent relationships, which means that people are not providing all of their necessities themselves, but other people uh, provide them and they will buy them they might be goods or they might be services. And so this system of division of labor, interdependent relationships did allow many things, but particularly allowed time. And time meant that there could be accomplishment. It meant that people could write, could think, could build things. So civilization is predicated on this concept of division of labor and interdependent relationships, which began at Sumer in Mesopotamia about 3500 BC. Some scholars say as early as 4500, others as late as 3200, let's just say 3500 BC. If you'd like to pursue this study, I recommend this book, Samuel Kramer, History Begins at Sumer, and he lists 26 firsts, that is, for instance, the first bicameral legislature, uh, the first uh, school of pharmacy, and so forth, uh, the first history writing. And it, it, it's very, very fascinating. But as far as we know, that was the first civilization in the world. Now, about 500 years later, we see three other civilizations. It is possible, uh, very likely, that people from Sumer went to these places, and they are China, Egypt, and India and they took civilization to them. The Chinese have a record of people coming uh, from the West to bring the things, to, knowledge to them. And, and China is the only civilization that has a continuous history. It's continued for all that time since it began, which would be probably around 3000 or 27. I think most Chinese uh, scholars are now saying around 2700 BC. Egypt began at the same time, approximately. Uh, it does, did not continue beyond the time of the uh, the Greeks coming along, Mesopotamia, uh, the uh, uh, and then the Romans. Uh, India, the civilization was built primarily around two cities, Mohenjo-daro and Harappa. Uh, they were early, likely, again, they were the result of somebody coming from Sumer or maybe Egypt or India or uh, uh, China, rather, and uh, that that did not continue. And a later civilization predicated on the Aryans uh, took over India. They'd made great contributions. So these are the earliest civilizations in the world. And let's go back to Mesopotamia for a moment and focus there because we're going to be dealing with another Mesopotamian civilization. First Sumer, let's say 3500, it comes to an end around 1900 BC. The Akkadians came in and controlled from around 
1900. They have been there as far back as 2400 and lasted until 2270. The Akkadians called the, these Sumer people black or dark, indicating their skin was darker than that of the Akkadians. The Sumerians had not given themselves a name. They did not need to differentiate because they were the only civilization in the world. So they just were there. But the Akkadians gave them the name Sumerian. Uh, the Akkadians, their name from Akkad, which was uh, established by Nimrod. In, we read about that in the 10th chapter of Genesis. However, the location of the city of Akkad has never been found. That is for something that is remaining for the future. After Akkadia, we have the Amorites, Babylonians, the first Babylonian civilization that extends from around 2000 to 1600. This is the civilization of Hammurabi, and uh, Hammurabi produced the first complete law code in the world. After the fall of the first Babylonian empire in 1600, we have the Kassites, and we have the Huranians, and we have the Mitanni. These three civilizations controlled the Fertile Crescent Mesopotamian region until about 1100. At that time, we have the Assyrians. They came in around 1300 BC, uh, were developed into a viable civilization around 1100, and developed a strong dynasty around 900. They will control Mesopotamia until about 606. We looked at the Assyrian civilization last week. And then the Neo-Babylonians. So another civilization in Babylon, 606 to 539. That is our focus for today. In 539, they were taken by the Persians. And the Persians then fell uh, to the Greeks and the Greeks to the Romans. So this Neo-Babylonian or Chaldean Empire was created by Nabopolassar. And then his son, Nebuchadnezzar II, was the great ruler of this Chaldean Empire, this Neo-Babylonian Empire. And he ruled between 605 and 561. The Babylonians will defeat Assyria to gain control of or the Fertile Crescent in 606 at the Battle of Carchemish. In the year 612, the capital city of Nineveh of Assyria had fallen to the Babylonians, but the entire empire did not fall to them until 606 in the Battle of Carchemish. Then they conquered the entire area. They took the Jews, the people of the southern kingdom, Judah, into captivity on three occasions, thus incrementally. 604, 597, and 586 BC. In 586, this was the last uh, deportation. Uh, they will also destroy the city of Jerusalem. They will destroy the temple in 586. And as we said, the empire fell to the Persians in 539. Now, this is really made great by Nebuchadnezzar. And here is a cameo of Nebuchadnezzar II. And here you see a map of the Babylonian Empire. Now, if we were to superimpose this upon the map of the Assyrian Empire, and that on top of the map that shows the extent of the uh, Mitanni and Hurani and, and Kassites, and that on top of the, uh, the original Babylonian Empire, that on top of Akkadia, that on top of uh, Sumer. What you will see would be each time that we add another map, it, it is going to extend farther and farther out because each successive empire controls more land. And so we come to the Greeks, they're going to control even more. And of course, the Romans are going to control a vast empire. Uh, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon may be mythical, but it's, we find in, uh, writings in literature about it, uh, and it is counted as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This is an artist's depiction. We don't have a picture, of course, of it, uh, but uh, it is usually seen as being appended to the palace of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. Now, no doubt about what you're seeing here. This really is 
a monument built by Nebuchadnezzar. It's the Ishtar Gate. Ishtar was one of the goddesses of the uh, Babylonians. Uh, this great monument, this gate into the palace uh, of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, had fallen apart when the city was taken, and these tiles were in the dirt and been covered up. But the Germans excavated there, found the tiles, and then rebuilt them, cleaned them up, and rebuilt them. And this is the result. This is now on display in the Pergamum Museum in Berlin. Absolutely spectacular. Uh, you see more of the panels of the Ishtar Gate, and another here. And you see the lions here. But what, what you're looking at here is a long wall that leads up to the gate. And that is depicted here in this model, uh, a small model of the entire thing, right in the midst of the, the real gates. Uh, you can see the wall and the gate itself. That built by Nebuchadnezzar as a good example of the spectacular beauty and tremendous architectural achievement of the Babylonians. Now, specifications of Babylon. Just to get an idea, 196 square miles, 14 mile sides, and a 56 mile circumference. The city was surrounded by a 30 foot wide moat. It had double walls. The outer wall was 311 feet high, which is the height of a 30 story building. We normally count. Uh, that uh, a story is, is 10 feet. It, it was 87 feet wide, meaning you could park 11 cars abreast across the top. If you recall from our study last week, talking about Nineveh, the walls of Nineveh would accommodate six cars abreast. So you can see this is almost twice as thick, as wide uh, as the wall at Nineveh. Or it could park eight chariots abreast. There were 100 gates in this wall of solid brass, and the hinges and the lintels on these gates were also of brass. There were 250 watchtowers. They were each 100 feet higher than the outer walls, which would mean they were 411 feet high or the height of a 40-story building. Here is another conceptual depiction of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Again, it is thought that these Hanging Gardens were attached to Nebuchadnezzar's palace. Again, it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But Nebuchadnezzar became mad, became insane. And the story of that is extremely interesting. And it is another story uh, that we can see the fulfillment of God's prophetic word. Now, Daniel, a Jewish man who had taken, been taken away in one of the first captivities of the Babylonians, had the gift of interpreting dreams. The king had a dream about a tree that was cut down. He didn't understand the interpretation of it. It was given to Daniel. So we see here in Daniel 4, at verse 24 and following, the interpretation of this dream. And so Daniel will say to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, it is a decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king, that you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Now, the, these words in the dark bold type, uh, I added, I put, I put them in the bold type. They are, in, of course, in the text. But I did so to emphasize the fact that God is saying through Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to be mad until you know and come to terms with and understand that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Note, he does not describe God as Yahweh, Jehovah. He is described as the Most High. Continuing the reading in verse 26, and it was commanded 
and with what commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. Now, the prophecy, if we summarize it, it's a consequence of his hubris, that is his pride, and a failure to give God, who is known as the Most High, to give God the glory. And therefore, he was to become, because of that, mad for a period of time until he regained his senses and repented. And then God res would restore his throne to him. Essentially, that is it. It is a prophecy from God of what's going to happen to this man and what will happen on the time that he repents. Now, what's behind it? Of what is he repenting? What is the sin he has committed? His failure to give God the glory. And God says throughout his word, I will not share my glory with another. He does not allow men to take glory to themselves. So let's read in Daniel 4.28, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, now this is going back, at the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. Now, if that hanging garden was attached to the palace, he was seeing that. And the king answered and said, is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence, and for the glory of my majesty. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately, the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird's claws. Again, no archaeological or even historical evidence exists to really prove the existence of these hanging gardens. However, it is an accepted uh, concept. And here you see artists depicting it as appended to the palace in Babylon. But scripture tells us clearly that Nebuchadnezzar viewed the city from the roof of his palace. And so he would have had such a view as this or this, another conception of a very beautiful scene that he would see. And his reaction is, oh, what I've done, how great I have made this city, this, this Babylon. I have done it for my own glory. So his repentance, verse 34, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever. And I have, Put these in the bold type to emphasize for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand and say to him what have you done at the same time Nebuchadnezzar now speaking, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he's able to humble. And Nebuchadnezzar would well know what happened to those who walk in pride and who get humbled. Now, there's an interesting confirmation 
And that confirmation is found in a proclamation by Nebuchadnezzar himself. And that proclamation is found in the British Library. I have seen it. My wife has seen it. Uh, Danny and Marty Hale saw it. Danny took a picture. And this is just the last part of it, uh, which you can see in this uh, picture on the screen. Uh, according to thy favor, Lord, which thou hast bestowed upon all people, cause me to love thy exalted lordship. Create in my heart the worship of thy divinity and grant whatever is pleasing to thee because thou hast fashioned my life. Now, of course, you, you only see the last part of it and you'll have to take my word for it. But if you read the whole thing, it sounds almost identical to what I just read from Daniel chapter four. And thus he is acknowledging the sovereignty of God. In the statement from Daniel, the Most High, he calls him Marta, but the idea is the same. He came to understand the sovereignty of one God. Now you see a picture of the actual proclamation down at the bottom, the uh, brown-looking document, and above is simply a translation of it. Well, that's for the spectacular. There are other prophecies, though, about Babylon and its fall. Most of them from Isaiah, some from Jeremiah. So let's take a look at those. From Isaiah 13, Babylon would be attacked by the Medes. This is at the end now of the Babylonian Empire. Behold, I am stirring up the Medes against them, who have no regard for silver and who do not delight in gold. Their bows will slaughter the young men. They will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity children. What we know of the Medes is that they controlled a vast amount of land and they controlled a very effective, capable army. As you can see from this, they were not given to uh, the beauties of this world, no interest particularly in silver and gold, but much interest in warfare. The Medes had combined with the Babylonians to overthrow the Assyrians earlier in 606. Now the Medes are joining with the Persians uh, to attack the Babylonians, which they will do. So we talk about this being the Medo-Persian Empire. Now, the fulfillment of this, Cyrus the Great, the founder of the Persian Empire, five, around 550, overthrew his father-in-law, who was the king of Media. His father-in-law was the Stiagis. He overthrew him and acquired the Medes' large territory and powerful army. So you have a combination of a very powerful army with a very capable politician, Cyrus the Great, one who was raised up by God. He, Cyrus, was able to build Persia into a mighty empire. And in one night, in 539, by diverting the river Euphrates and entering through the water gate, the city was destroyed using the Median army in one night. Now, there's no doubt that God was behind Cyrus, for it clearly teaches in Isaiah 45 that the Lord raised him up. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. And then we read that the Babylon's kingdom would be overthrown and it would be overthrown permanently. It would become like Sodom and Gomorrah. It would exist no more. Here's the prophecy in Isaiah. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherds will make their flocks lie down there. But wild animals will lie down there, and their houses will be full of howling creatures. Their ostriches will dwell, and their wild goats will dance. Hyenas will cry in his towers, and jackals in the pleasant palaces. Its time is close at hand, and its days will not be prolonged. And yes, it happened. 
The prophecy says clearly it will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherds will make their flocks there. Floyd Hamilton says, to give us the fulfillment now, travelers report that the city, Babylon, is absolutely uninhabited, even for Bedouins. There are various superstitions current among the Arabs that prevent them from pitching their tents there, while the character of the soil prevents the growth of vegetation suitable for the pasturage of flocks. And we have many people reporting that Arabs, particularly ones who served as guides to the site of ancient Babylon, have been known to simply disappear before nightfall because they believe the site is haunted. So they, they do not pitch their tent there. That is still true. They will not pitch their tent on the site of ancient Babylon. And to further illustrate that Babylon's kingdom would be overthrown permanently until recent archeological discoveries, the location of Babylon was unknown. Today, its ruins are located, but since the medieval times, nothing has been built on the site. Although Saddam Hussein had in mind its rebuilding, but his demise precluded that. Babylon is located about 30 miles south uh, of Baghdad. So the fall of Babylon occurred on October 13th, 539. According to the Greek historians Herodotus and Xenophon, the Persians, after laying siege to Babylon, saw that they could in no way storm the massive walls or break down their gates. They had two Babylonian deserters, Cobrias and Gadatas entered their camp. At this time, Chrysantas, a counselor to Cyrus, made the observation that the Euphrates River ran underneath these gigantic walls and was deep enough and wide enough to march an army under. Cyrus ordered his troops to dig huge ditches. And while the two deserters delay plans for attacking Babylon from uh, within her walls, while the Persians were building canals to divert the course of the river, the Babylonians were laughing and mocking their enemy inside their walls. The Babylonians were carousing at an annual feast to their gods and celebrating their victory over the Persians without realizing that Cyrus had diverted the Euphrates River from underneath the walls of Babylon and was at that very time entering the city with his troops. Further, we read that no stones would be removed for other construction projects. And here we turn to Jeremiah, chapter 51, verse 26. No stone shall be taken from you for a corner and no stone for a foundation, but you shall be a perpetual waste, declares the Lord. Peter Stoner says, bricks in building materials of many kinds have been salvaged from the ruins from cities round about, but the rocks which were imported to Babylon at such great cost have never been moved. Further, the prophecy in Isaiah 13 that desert creatures would infest the ruins. Wild animals will lie down there and their houses will be full of howling creatures. Ostriches will dwell and there will be wild goats will dance. Sir Austin Henry Layard says, a large gray owl is found in great numbers, frequently in flocks of nearly a hundred, in the low shrubs among the ruins of Babylon. Jackals skulk through the furrows, exactly as prophesied. A mention of the animals seems to be one of the major com comments of the modern travelers and archaeologists who go to Babylon. They see all these animals. And then further, Babylon is going to be reduced to swampland. The prophecy in Isaiah 14, I will rise up against them, declares the Lord of hosts, and will cut off from Babylon name and remnant, descendants and posterity, declares the Lord. And I will make it a possession of the hedgehog and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the broom of destruction, declares the Lord of hosts. Well, that happened. The site of Babylon was deserted and it became a swamp in the area of the Euphrates. The Encyclopedia Britannica says, a large part of the old city buried under a deep bed of silt remains to be found. And the Babylon of Hammurabi, that's the earlier 
empire, of which only the slenderest traits have been detected, now lies beneath the water table. Austin Layard continues, the great part of the country below ancient Babylon has now been for centuries one great swamp. The embankment of the rivers, utterly neglected, have broken away, and the waters have spread over the face of the land. And then the prophecy that the ancient city would not be frequently visited. Her cities have become a horror, a land of drought and desert, a land in which no one dwells and through which no son of man passes. In fulfillment, Peter Stoner says that though nearly all ancient cities are on prominent tourist routes, Babylon is not and has very few visitors. And the prophecy in Isaiah 14, that Babylon would be reduced to swampland. I will make it a possession of the hedgehog and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the broom of destruction, declares the Lord of hosts. Now, Egypt contrasted with Babylon is an interesting situation. God had prophesied some rather bad things, some woes, some great woes against Egypt. They would become a base kingdom. They would no longer be ruled by any native prince. We'll see that in a few weeks when we study Egypt. It would be reduced and become a base country, fallen from its original greatness, but, but it would continue. Babylon, on the other hand, as great, if not greater than Egypt at its height, would be destroyed permanently. And this is the situation to this day. Egypt remains, Babylon is gone. In the ancient world, there were many centers of religious worship. Memphis, Thebes, both in Egypt, Babylon, Nineveh in Mesopotamia, and Jerusalem. They were among them. God condemned the cities in which the false gods flourished, idols, such like, only one city out of the above listed has remained, and you know which one. So Babylon, after its fall, what happened? Alexander the Great thought to restore its great temple, which was in ruins in his day, which is the fourth century BC, but uh, he was deterred by the prohibitive cost of doing that. During the period of Alexander's successors, the area decayed rapidly and soon became a desert. During the reign of Augustus, the first Roman emperor, Strabo, the Roman geographer, visited the site and commented the great cities become a desert. Trajan visited Babylon in 116 during his campaign against the Parthians and found, according to Diocasius, a Roman historian, mounds and legends of mounds. In AD 363, the Emperor Julian engaged in a war with the Sassanid rulers of Persia and during one campaign destroyed the walls of Babylon, which had been partially restored by the Sassanids, who used the enclosed area as a hunting preserve. 54 miles south of modern Baghdad lie the desolate and sand-swept ruins of the once proud city of Babylon. Now let's go back over some very specific predictions. Babylon was to be like Sodom and Gomorrah, that is completely destroyed. It was never to be inhabited again. Tents would not be pitched there by the Arabs. Sheepfolds would not be there. Desert creatures would infest the ruins. Stones would not be removed for other construction projects. The ancient city would not be frequently visited, and it would be covered with the swamps of water. Now, the possibility of the fulfillment of the first seven of these eight, which Peter Stoner calculated, would be one in five billion possibility. And that, of course, is virtually nil. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Babylon is used to symbolize the sinful society of the world. 
Uh, look how similar Revelation 18 appears uh, as to the prophecies of the destruction of Babylon. But here, John, the writer by inspiration, is speaking of the, uh, the society of the world. Notice the comparison. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. And this is Babylon today. This is an interesting comment by the archaeologist Edward Chiera. A dead city. I have visited Pompeii and Ostia, and I have taken walks along the empty quarters of the Palatine. But those cities are not dead. They're only temporarily abandoned. The hum of life is still heard, and life blooms all around. But here, Babylon, here only is real death. Not a column or an arch still stands to demonstrate the permanency of human work. Everything has crumbled into dust. But a certain fascination holds me here. I should like to find a reason for all this desolation. Why should such a flourishing city, the seat of an empire, have completely disappeared? Is it the fulfillment of a prophetic curse that changed a superb temple into a den of jackals? Did the action to the people who who lived here have anything to do with this, or is it a fatal destiny of mankind that all its civilizations must crumble when they reach their peak? And what are we doing here, trying to wrest from the past its secrets, when probably we ourselves and our own achievements may become an object of search for peoples to come? Next week in our study, <clears throat> Lord willing, we shall turn to Tyre and Sidon, two Phoenician cities, but very different, with very different prophecies about each of them. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit.